Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's uh, Mel Herbert here, and I'm with Jess Mason. We're going to be talking about the, the novel Coronavirus 2019 chapter that's in Corpendium. So this review is of uh, March 16th. We are constantly updating the textbook at this point, uh, pretty much on a daily basis. Um, we did a significant amount of revising over the weekend, and uh, so we want to go through that now in case you don't get a chance to read it and you just want to listen to this in the car or you're going to watch it uh, when you get home. So uh, Jess, I guess the first and most important thing to say is that this is changing obviously very rapidly. We're not yes. focusing on sort of the big picture of school closures or anything like that. We're just trying to get you information uh, for use clinically in the emergency department. Um, but it is changing all the time. We're getting more reports from China, more reports from Italy. We'll soon, I'm sure, start to have some uh, clinical reports from the US about these patients and how they look. But um, the key thing is that this is changing constantly. We should be one of your sources, but please go to the U um, CDC and WHO constantly, right? Right. And so the way we're going to do this is we're basically going to follow the outline in the Corpendium chapter on novel coronavirus 2019. So we're going to talk our way through that and hit some of the really basic stuff. And along the way, we'll give you some of the updates that we know of as of today. So Mel, uh, the approach that we're following in Corpendium is to start with the critical patient. So let's start with airway. Why don't you take that one? What do we need to know as we're thinking about managing the airway of possible COVID patients. Right. So we know that about 15% of people are going to get pretty sick and uh, need to be hospitalized. And a percent of those, maybe 5% um, of the total, will need an ICU stay um, or it's two to five percent, according to sort of the uh, Chinese experience. So intubation might be required. And this is actually, let's be very clear, this is a very dangerous time for you as a healthcare worker during uh, the intubation time. So um, the suggestions are that you wear an N95 mask. You might want to, if you've got them, use one of those PAPA devices. And if you don't know what they are, they're basically these portable devices with a battery pack with a helmet. They suck in air, they filter it. And so you're breathing nice, clean, non-virus air. Um, and I know that a number of hospitals are using that. Um, you have to make sure, of course, and we'll talk about this more a little bit later, that when you take it off, you don't infect yourself from all the virus that could be all over the outside of that thing. Uh, eye shields for sure. And people are suggesting that they be um, like goggles and the seal sealed because the virus yeah. can get in. Gown and gloves and the usual stuff. Donning, putting the stuff on. Doffing, taking the stuff off. Very important. Again, we have links later on. We'll show you uh, in the CDC website. Obviously, the patient should be isolated as soon as possible. If you're in triage, you see one of these patients, they're really sick. You want to get them into a negative pressure isolation room if possible. If you don't have that, then at the minimum, just put them into a room by themselves, a private room. Uh, intubation should be with uh, the usual rapid sequence techniques with um, a few caveats there. First of all, um, it probably should be the most experienced intubator. You want to get this in as fast as you can, and you want to get this in with as few um, attempts as possible. It's also being suggested, and I think it's a good suggestion, that you use a um, video laryngoscope. The reason you can, uh, would use that, instead of putting your face right up against this patient as you're tubing, as you might normally do, you can do it like this, like this, over there, looking at the screen so you're not getting a face full of this virus. Um, now, there's a lot of controversy about the use of non-invasive ventilation and high-flow nasal O2. So, um, in general, uh, sort of the experts, Scott Weingart and others, people who have been talking about this, think if you can just intubate the patient, you can get better seals, you can put on viral filters, and you're not necessarily going to be um, uh, volatilizing some of these uh, viral uh, pieces, as it were. Um, but in the Chinese and the Italian experience, uh, they had so many patients come in that they couldn't tube them all. We also know that just for pure pneumonia, non-invasive ventilation is not as good as intubation. Um, but again, if you're seeing a high volume of these patients, you might have to try uh, this stuff. The WHO actually says about high flow nasal O2 that is a reasonable thing to try. We don't know if this sheds virus more um, than not using high flow nasal O2. So there's some you know, controversy about this. One of the reasons it might not be an issue is because when you cough or sneeze, you are generating about 400 liters per second. And when we put a high flow nasal O2, you're maybe 30 or 60 liters per second. So it's certainly less than sneezing constantly. 
Um, but that is sort of a recommendation that the WHO has in uh, big sort of red letters. We think it might be okay, but we're not sure. But again, um, if you need to do it because the person's hypoxic and you can't do other measures, it's something to consider. So and I think that th there's maybe a, a role for that. It, like you said, if we're out of ventilators and hopefully we don't get to that point at all. Right. Um, but also, it, we don't know in the emergency department, we generally don't know if the patient's going to be COVID positive or negative and they may have other medical conditions and if this patient would otherwise have benefited from non-invasive ventilation. So you think they're hypercapnic um, and they have COPD or perhaps they're having heart failure exacerbation, but they also have URI symptoms. That would be the, the patient who would be a better choice for this, um, you know, rather than just all patients. But, uh, but we'll see if we get to the point that, that we run out of ventilators and that might broaden the, the use of non-invasive non ventilation. I also wanna add a couple more things, Mel. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the importance of PPE and I really wanna stress that it is more important that you get in PPE than that you intubate the patient immediately because you are gonna be seeing a lot of patients and if you get sick and you get quarantined or you get very sick and hospitalized, that's less patients that you can take care of. So the effect of a healthcare personnel getting COVID has much broader effect on the population than a non-healthcare personnel getting sick. And so take the extra couple of minutes. I know we oftentimes we get heroic and we rush in, we want to intubate the person correct, correctly, and, but we don't put on the, the proper gear just in a normal intubation. Don't do that. Take the time, even if it means that that patient is going to be hypoxic another minute longer than they were. Just take the time and do it right. And also you mentioned video uh, laryngoscopy for intubation, which is a great idea, but be mindful where you're positioning the screen. Because if you're intubating like this and the screen is over here and you have your head turned to the side, you're then exposing the side of your face, which may not be as well protected with eye shields and masks and things like that. Um, and so you want to position the screen so that you're not kinking your neck in funny positions while you intubate. Those are uh, excellent points. So let's talk about uh, breathing for these patients. Again, we're talking about the crashing patient. We're talking about the sickest uh, group of patients. And so there's nothing uh, necessarily specific that has come out about how to ventilate these patients, but basically follow an ARDS-net like protocol is what all of our ICU experts are telling us, which basically means you're using as small a tidal volumes as possible so that you're not overstretching the normal lung and making that uh, sick as well. We have a table in the textbook right up front about the ARDS-net uh, protocols. We also have a link at the top of the chapter of a discussion with uh, Swami and Scott Weingart and also a link to Scott's um, website where he also talks about how they do this. And they also, uh, Swami did a review with Haney Malamet recently where they just reviewed ARDSnet and, and what that means for ventilation. So it was an excellent review that we just did in the last couple of weeks on MRAP. In terms of uh, circulation, yeah, a subset of these patients are going to get septic shock. Um, and again, you're going to treat them in the usual fashion. Uh, we have a link to our septic shock chapter. There's nothing necessary specific yet, although Ar uh, Armel has noted that maybe there is a subset of these patients that are developing some form of myocarditis and they might need inotrope support specifically for that. Again, just a few reports. We don't know how big a deal this is. We will continue to update that if we get uh, more information. The other thing that the WHO is suggesting is also if the person's really sick, um, remember that there's not just COVID out there, this could be another type of pneumonia. So in the very sick patients, they are covering them with antibiotics for the usual community acquired pneumonia, things that can make you septic. Because sometimes you just don't know if this is COVID or something else. Now, uh, we've gone through airway breathing, circulation, resuscitating to the usual endpoints, um, expecting that the patient may go into multi-organ failure, septic shock uh, is, is a strong possibility and acute respiratory distress syndrome. So to keep all those things in mind. Um, so on shift, Jess, what are you doing to protect yourself um, with these patients? Mm -hmm. Yep. So uh, fortunately, we don't have a ton of cases yet in Fresno. We are doing active screening and we're doing this out in tents. So before patients even make it into the ER, if they fall, we follow an algorithm. And if they are someone who may need to be screened for COVID, they're going straight into a tent. And when I'm working in the tent, it's full PPE. So the donning and doffing should be meticulously reviewed. 
Um, we have posted a link to a video that shows how to do that. We also have the steps broken down and you should be very, very meticulous about how you do this going in and out of a situation like a tent or a resuscitation. So that's the way we're doing it, basically putting everything on, going into the tent um, and doing the evaluation there. And sometimes not even doing the evaluation in the tent. We have iPads set up so we can do this over FaceTime. Um, and only going in if it's really necessary for an examination. But we're not sending the sick patients there, we're sending the screening patients there. The sick patients are still coming in, getting an isolation room. And if you're seeing a patient in that setting, then you should be also in full PPE. Everyone who's going in and out of that room should be, and you should really limit the number of people who need, only to, to those who need to go in and out. Now, the good news that we have from uh, the experience in Hong Kong is that if you follow these procedures as outlined by Jessen in the textbook here, uh, they essentially had a none, of, none of their healthcare workers become infected. A few of their healthcare workers did become infected, but this was right at the beginning when they weren't doing this. Um, but once they started following these procedures anal retentively, um, you can significantly reduce your chance of, of getting this infection. So let's Although we've already had two emergency physicians test positive in the United States at this point. So, and, and who knows what those exact circumstances were, um, but we should be very, very careful. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, diagnosis. And obviously a diagnosis depends on your pretest probability of the disease, history, physical, labs, x-ray. So we'll go through that. The thing with uh, the pretest probability is it's changing very quickly. It used to be just right. You were screening based on whether people were from high risk areas, b uh, but that might be changing rapidly, right? We still are screening uh, based off of that because we only have two confirmed cases in Fresno right now, and they're both travelers from outside of the city. And so we're still on a containment strategy, um, and we're only screening people who have symptoms and have been to an area where there are a lot of cases currently. Now, I know other cities who already have a lot of cases, that's irrelevant, and you're probably screening more based off of the presentation of the patient. So let's go through some of those key findings. Um, the signs and symptoms that a patient may present with. Um, so Mel, why don't you go through the history and then I'll do the physical exam findings. Okay, so uh, remember this is um, a viral syndrome, so it's gonna present like a viral syndrome. Um, there's a few things that are pretty specific. A lot of these patients have cough. So like 70% of the patients apparently have cough. Fever is not universal. Um, fever occurs about half the time. This is according to the Chinese reports in the New England Journal when the patients first present. It gets up to about 90% if they're sick and stay in the hospital. So fever is not uh, a guarantee. They have fatigue. They have some sputum production. Shortness of breath occurs in about 20% of cases. And of course, um, probably much more common in the sicker patients. They'll have sore throat they'll have headache. So a fairly nonspecific viral-like illness. Now, the epidemiologists have said, as this becomes more common, um, anybody that presents with a cold-like syndrome is probably going to be COVID as this becomes more common. Mm -hmm. So what about the physical exam, Jess? Yeah, equally uh, not helpful, really. Um, so they, it's going to look just like any other viral illness, although some patients say they have some throat congestion. You might see tonsillar swelling, but these are uncommon findings. Um, and so really nothing specific that's going to help you. And that's actually why for a lot of these patients that are otherwise well that you're screening, you can do it over an iPad. You don't even actually have to go in and see the patient in person because the physical exam isn't typically going to add anything very helpful here. So maybe, maybe you feel like you want to listen to their lungs, but is that really going to change whether or not you swab them? No. So the physical exam is not a game changer. A few things about differential diagnosis before we go into diagnostic tests. Obviously, this is occurring during flu season, so flu could be causing this patient's symptoms. A common cold could be causing this patient's symptoms. Other viruses could be causing this. Um, but obviously, the one that we're most worried about is COVID-19, and that's the one we want to exclude. Um, it's also true that all of the usual stuff that people get every day and, and come to the emergency department is out there as well. So don't focus too much on this pneumonia must be COVID-19. It could be something else. So keep your differential diagnosis broad uh, in these patients who present with these symptoms and just add COVID-19 to that. So now you're concerned about it, let's talk about uh, the diagnostic tests. So um, first of all, let's talk about the PCR test. So the test that is being used right now, the WHO one, the CDC, um, the ones that are here in the US and now we're hopefully this week we'll get a lot more of them, is a PCR test. And what they do with this PCR test 
is that it picks out two genes out of this virus and then amplifies them and then they do their magic thing in the lab and they say positive or negative. Um, how sensitive and how specific is this test? And that comes up all the time. And unfortunately, it's very frustrating. We don't know exactly. We know that it's not perfectly sensitive. And how do we know that? Because there's a number of cases uh, from China where the patient clearly had the disease, they were very sick, they even had CT findings, um, and they tested negative. And then a day later, they tested positive. So uh, it's a little bit hard to say what exactly the sensitivity is. There is no gold standard yet for which we can test against. So just know that it's not perfect. It's probably pretty specific because PCR testing in general, if you've got these two genes and they're not in other viruses, are very specific as long as there's no contamination. So we think, let's say, what you know, a number of people are saying, probably 75 to 80% uh, sensitive and probably very specific. If you have a high-risk person you really think has the disease, one test is not enough. Let's talk about how that test is actually acquired. So this is acquired just like an influenza swab. It's, it's the same swab and it's inserted all the way back. It's a nasopharyngeal swab. So it's not a NERS swab. I saw a nurse swabbing just like the nostril a couple nights ago for an influenza test and I had to walk her through how it's actually done. Um, so that's really important. And it's not just one nasopharyngeal swab. There's a second swab and that's meant to swab the, um, the pharynx. Um, the posterior pharynx. So in trying to avoid touching the tongue. So it's two swabs that are sent off to try to make the diagnosis. Whoever is acquiring the swabs should be in full PPE. And in an ideal world, we would be doing this in an airborne isolation room. Um, that's not practical um, the way that we're starting to set up these tent systems and screen people from their cars or screen people in tents and never let them even come into the ER unless they're really sick. And so if that's the case, then actually sort of being in a, in a large space where there's air circulation is, is a good thing. But whoever's acquiring the swabs, full PPE. That's a, a good point, I should say, about sensitivity as well, because sensitivity is also really dependent on how well you get the sample. So if you don't do it right, it's not going to be very sensitive. So good point. What about the other lab findings that you might get? So other lab findings, if you were to even check labs, so someone who's going through just a screening and they're otherwise well enough to go home, there's no point in getting labs. Just swab them and let them go. If someone's coming into the emergency department and possibly being admitted to the hospital, you're probably going to be checking other labs. And you may see lymphocytopenia. This is in 70 to 80% of patients who end up being positive for COVID will have lymphocytopenia. Other things that you may see that help paint the picture, although again, everything's nonspecific here, are prolonged prothrombin time, elevated lactate dehydrogenase, low platelets, leukopenia, and an elevated C-reactive protein. But all of them are kind of nonspecific and you can't lean too heavily on any one of those. Right. So now let's talk about uh, radiology. So um, the experience again from China and Italy is that a lot of these patients will have findings on chest x-ray and a lot will have CT findings. So if you're concerned about the patient having pneumonia, you can get a, a chest x-ray. Uh, CT scanning is probably more sensitive, but we don't want to overdo that. And there was a study that came out that said that they could use it as a screening test. We don't suggest you screen with CT scanning for a number of practical reasons. Uh, Jess, tell us. So we already have really long CT wait times where I work, and I'm sure at a lot of places. And if you send a patient in who's a COVID rule out, then they have to go, first of all, of course, with the mask. Everyone has to be ready for them. You call ahead, let, let them know you're sending them. They're all in full PPE. But then when the patient leaves, they have to do a full disinfection. Um, and that's going to be set up by your own hospital, what that means to disinfect the CT area. But it slows down the entire process and the entire emergency department if we're using it that as our screening tool. So be very cautious about that. Chest x-ray, I think it does potentially play an, uh, a good role here because it can be acquired um, a lot more efficiently and you can get a portable chest. So rather than sending the patient and infecting the whole radiology department, you can just send the portable machine to their room. So before we get into treatment, actually, I want to do this a little bit backwards and first talk about who should admit and who should go home. 85% um, of the patients that get infected with this virus, particularly in the young, are going to have mild symptoms. It's going to be a bad cold and that's it. So you want to send as many patients home as possible to self-quarantine to not infect the hospital. And uh, obviously there are going to be people at the other end of the spectrum. There's going to be the elderly and there are going to be people who just have a bad form of this and they're obviously going to need to be admitted. It's going to change, I think, over time how many people we admit, but in general, I think the concept should be, I'm going to screen them, 
And if they test positive, I'm going to be ag as aggressive as possible about sending these patients home and saying, look, if you get worse, then come back. But you want to send home as many people as possible. We are not going to have enough beds. And that quarantine or self-isolation or self-quarantine period is generally 12 days is the current recommendation for how they isolate themselves. And there's great recommendations on the CDC website for what home isolation means. So you can be sure to set up. And I highly recommend we have done some standard COVID discharge instructions for people who are going home so they know exactly what this means. So if they don't want to be um, if we want to reduce the chances they're going to infect other people around them. And I would specifically ask anyone who you're discharging, are you, do you, what's your living situation? Do you live with people who are elderly? Do you live with people who have immune system problems? Because you want to be even more cautious of, to make sure they understand how important self-isolation is and what that means. So let's talk about um, treatment then specifically. Um, there is no treatment for this virus yet. There's no vaccine and there's no antivirals yet. So it's all supportive care. Having said that, Jess, there is some possibilities. So can you tell us about what those possible treatments might be? Yes, and the good thing is that there are already well over 100 studies in progress to look for treatments, both existing antivirals, antibacterials even, and also to try to develop new treatments. So some of the ones that are on the horizon, remdesivir. Um, so there's some preliminary data, um, just in vitro data, that it's currently under further investigation, um, but it was used in patients who had MERS and it's also been studied in animal studies. So we'll, we will try to be very current with any information we give about um, any updates with remdesivir. Chloroquine is another one that's shown promise in preliminary data. And then some of the HIV medications, lopinavir, ritonavir, um, may have anti-coronavirus activity as well. Um, another one, this one's harder to pronounce, so I'm glad I, I got this one. Favipiravir is another antiviral that uh, we're going to be watching closely. So th those are some of the big ones. There are many more. And right now we still have no great data on how to use them, uh, what doses to use. I, I would say if I was caring for a very sick patient, I would probably try an experimental treatment on them um, because, you know, risk versus benefit, even though we don't know exactly how much benefit there is. Um, so I would, I would strongly consider trying these in, the, in a very sick subset of patients. So because there's no specific therapies yet, uh, because there's no vaccine yet, this is all about um, flattening the curve. So you've probably heard this one million times and you might be sick of it by now. But the concept of flattening the curve is uh, a lot of people are going to get this. A subset are going to get sick. They're going to come to the emergency department and a subset of those are going to get admitted. And if that all happens at around the same time, you overwhelm your healthcare system. So what we want to do is flatten the curve so we spread the cases over as long a time period as possible so that we have enough beds, so that we have enough ICU units. So let's talk about transmission. This is droplet spread and it probably occurs via fomites. So you sneeze and you've got the disease and the virus sort of is on those droplets and it floats in the air and then it falls down. So the way you can reduce this is by the things you've heard a million times. You sneeze into your sort of elbow. You do this social distancing where you're at least six feet apart from people. You don't gather in big groups. And if you follow all this, you can significantly reduce person-to-person -person transmission. You wipe down surfaces. You wash your hands uh, anal retentively whenever you've come into contact with any new surface or anything like that. And if you do that over groups of uh, populations, you can significantly reduce the number of people um, that get this over the time frame. But it is probable that at least half the population, depending on the modeling you look at, at least half the population will eventually, in the next year or so, be infected uh, with this virus. And while we think that respiratory droplets are the very most likely the mode of transmission, viral particles have been identified in blood in urine and in stool. And so it's unknown if there's fecal oral transmission. And so until this is better understood, that's why hand washing is so, so important. Be very meticulous about that. Um, let's talk about some special groups then. The special groups I wanna talk about is the very young, the very old, and the very pregnant. So first of all- <laughs> Or a little bit pregnant. <laughs> even a little bit pregnant. So 
For the kids, the good news is that um, the report so far is that kids certainly can get this disease and kids can get sick. There's one report out of China of uh, six kids that were pretty sick and had to be admitted, but no deaths under the age of nine. So don't be fooled that kids can't get sick. They can, but they just seem much less likely than elderly patients. Patients over the age of 80 have a significant mortality. So about a 15% mortality over the age of 80. And if you've got comorbid diseases, particularly you know lung disease, uh, hepatic, uh, renal disease, um, you're at much uh, greater likelihood, as is true in every disease, right? Every viral illness, every pneumonia is worse you know, than the elderly. You diabetes, know, all the routine stuff we always talk about. Exactly. So uh, what about in pregnancy, Jess? Yes, very controversial and also very much unknown at this point. Um, I've seen two studies to this point that possibly sort of address this question, one that was concerning and one that was very reassuring. The concerning one is in pre-proof from the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and they had they were not able to review any cases of COVID positive patients, but looking at patients who had MERS and SARS, it was very concerning in terms of complications such as uh, ARDS, DIC, uh, fetal demise, preterm labor. Now, that's also that's very scary. However, there was a very small case series of patients from China who delivered babies while pregnant with COVID and they all did well and there was no vertical transmission. And in six of those patients, they tested the first breast milk, they tested the amniotic fluid and the cord blood and those were all negative. So that's very reassuring, but that's six patients. So none of, none of this, can we, we can't reach conclusions from any of this. And I think the lesson here is we need to be considering pregnant patients as a vulnerable population. And if they test positive or are being screened and isolated, they should be followed by um, closely by their obstetrician and perhaps maternal fetal medicine. Yeah, great points. And again, unfortunately, we're going to keep saying we don't know, we're not sure. Uh, so let me give you a couple of more. We don't know, we're not sure about therapeutics. Um, there is some concern that non-steroidals might exacerbate this. A few reports, um, it's hard to know right now. Uh, the data is very poor. And the other one is because this virus actually enters through the uh, ACE inhibitor receptor, what does that mean for people that are on ACE receptor blockers or ARBs where you might actually get upregulation of that receptor? You have more of them out there. Does that make you more infectious? I've been talking to the primary care people. We've been talking to clinical pharmacists and there's just not enough data to know what to do. So as soon as we get more data, if it becomes available, we will certainly be reporting on that. But I know right now people are a bit anxious about this, but we don't have an answer as yet. Another thing that we haven't touched on yet that I think is really important um, when we were talking about making the diagnosis, um, in addition to sending a COVID swab, most of us are sending flu swabs and in some cases RSV swabs and looking for other viruses, looking for other etiologies that we can say, oh, okay, you don't have COVID, you have influenza and trying to reassure ourselves that that's all they have. And we're starting to learn a little bit more about co-infection rates Initially, the first data that was coming out was saying, hey, that the rate of co-infection is low. It's like 2% or lower. And so if they test positive for influenza, they probably don't have COVID. Mel, how has that changed in the last few days? Yeah, um, I've been reading these articles uh, that are coming out of China right now. So um, what's happening is that the CDC of China and here in the U.S., um, they get these uh, articles written and then they come in and now they're publishing before they're peer reviewed so that you can just have the data because this is changing so far. So understand that these are non-peer reviewed pu publications and they're often a little difficult to read because they haven't gone through that process of a medical journal editor and so sometimes the language is a little confusing. But one of the reports suggests that maybe as many as 6% of patients can be co-infected with other viruses at the same time, which is a significantly more than 2%. Um, so you can't right now, I think, say just because you're influenza positive, you have a really small chance of being COVID uh, positive as well. Um, I think you've got to test for both of them. And that's probably what the recommendation will be, is that you will do viral screening of all of them and COVID will be one of those things. There's an even more confusing and even scarier uh, study, again, not peer reviewed from China, that suggested in the really sick patients, the patients in the ICU, co-infection, uh, could occur between 20 and 80% of the time using IgM. So they have uh, COVID-19 and then they do this IgM screening and they're positive for a number of different things. Again, we don't know what to do with that. We don't know the timing of that. 
Um, so I just don't know what to do with it, but d do know that you probably should be screening for um, more than just sort of influenza. You can't now, if you're particularly in the middle of a, a cluster, just because your influenza is positive doesn't mean you might also have COVID-19. Now, a couple things that I want to add here is that, um, first of all, I think we're going to start running low on our ability to swab everyone for RSV, for example. And so our hospital has already said, be cautious about who you're sending the RSV on. Is that really going to be helpful? Because if that comes back positive, um, you're not going to then tell the patient they don't have to be in isolation. I mean, it might be reassuring information for them that they have something else. And so their chance of COVID is much lower. However, they need to remain in isolation until the COVID test actually comes back. And furthermore, I really suspect that as we start to cohort these patients together in tents, co-infection rates, I think, are going to start to go up. Now, that's my speculation, but I just, I, I, we're putting these people with various viruses all together in a tent. And so how could you not see increasing rates of co-infection as time goes on? Yeah. Um, one other thing too, just we're doing a lot of testing right now, which is absolutely appropriate. We should be doing that. But again, the clinical epidemiologists say uh, this is really good for tracking to see where it's going to try and flatten the curve. But there will become a point where COVID is so prevalent in the community. Basically, when somebody comes with a cough and a fever and a runny nose, um, it's just COVID-19 uh, at extraordinarily high probabilities. It happens during flu season. When you see somebody during flu season that looks like they have the flu, guess what? They've got the flu 95% mm -hmm. of the time. So we're right. not there yet. We'll still be doing a lot of uh, testing, flattening the curve. But um, soon, depending on where you live, you'll just be able to say, that looks like a cold. It's probably COVID-19. We're not quite there yet. Look, this is changing constantly. We are updating this chapter constantly. We've got links all through this to the CDC and to other sites. We'll be doing more live events with Dave Talon about some of these more controversial things probably in the next week. Uh, Jess and I will be doing some form of update, I think, every week on, on this. So just consider this a quick overview of the chapter um, and uh, a sort of a summary of what we know now, but it changes on the daily. Say something. Oh, I thought that was a nice ending right there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Remember, so. remember to wash your hands, <laughs> use, use hand sanitizer, wash your hands, protect yourself because as healthcare providers, health, including everyone, not just physicians, but nurses, everyone on the healthcare team, we have to be particularly cautious that we're protecting our other patients because we're not getting infected. And we're also not getting taken out of work because we're sick or we're quarantined and then being, not, not being able to provide enough healthcare to the massive droves of patients we're expecting to come in needing our services. Yeah, and we want to thank uh, Jess and everybody that's on the front lines doing stuff. This is it's really tough. It's uh, uh, hard to be a healthcare worker right now, but um, the world needs you. And uh, thank you for what you're doing. It's really important, really okay, important. Let me say one more thing. If you are a healthcare personnel who is pregnant, or perhaps you're older, or you have medical conditions, please communicate that with your medical director and take yourself out of the first line of, of defense here. Like let the other people get out there in the tents and put the PPE on. Um, so, so just, it may be uncomfortable to come forward and, and admit to some of the things you maybe weren't ready to share yet, but now is the time to be extra cautious. Yeah, I've seen some incredible random acts of kindness uh, that are exactly like that. A number of the young docs in departments have said, I'm going to pick up your shift talking to 65 year old people who have maybe had cancer or something else in their departments. Like mm -hmm. this is not the time for you to be a hero. There's plenty of other work for you to do in screening and, and stay away from the, the mm -hmm. highest risk patients. So it's been really amazing to watch the community come together over this and looking after each other. And perhaps a role for those providers is to be the person on the iPad, or if you're quarantined to be the person on the iPad, you can do a lot of good work from home in terms of screening and deciding who to swab and who to discharge. Great. All right. I think we'll leave it at that and we will uh, update you soon. Thanks, Jess, for all your work on this chapter and for all Thank your you. work on the front lines. And uh, again, on the daily, we'll be adding to this because there's so much unknown. So keep check back frequently.